thought that when someone is doing PhD, they need to stick to academia, like do the postdoctoral research and something like that. But I disagree with that idea. Problems by their hands and they, they use uh, structural engineering softwares such as uh, STAD, RISA, SAP. There's, there are so many. These are, there are some examples. So how did this, this software came up? This, this software came up based on the methodology developed by civil engineers called matrix analysis method. Like all the equations that cannot be solved for multi-degree of freedom problem that cannot be solved by hand. Nowadays, uh, I heard so many news about suicides in India and many places. People have suicide awareness, but the thing is, uh, somehow we are we are losing the, the, the idea of gratitude. We provide significant mental peace. So have gratitude for what you have. How the building will be built, it will be built just in the reverse order. So you, you need to be aware of the schedule, how the process works. You, you are designing the foundation last, but that is the first on the schedule for the construction people. Uh, th they will start building from the foundation and go up from substructure to superstructure. So you need to have very good understanding of the how uh, the whole process works. PhD students after completing PhD faces some kind of challenge to getting industry because of the reason that they are doing something in a depth, but they forget about expanding their bread but in industry people are looking for problem solvers like a little bit of metallurgy i would say mechanical metallurgy where people uh, study about grief fatigue fracture mechanics so these these are the area where everything is common so i call it applied mechanics so everyone can come. today's session features a guest whose work focuses on computational mechanics and uh, structural engineering so many of you who are familiar about structural engineering knows that in structural engineering a key task is repairing partially damaged structures such as buildings after an earthquake. What engineers do is they need to determine which parts are still safe and how to reinforce them effectively. Consider another example when working on repairing a partially damaged bridge, engineers need to understand how the material behaves to ensure the repair is safe and stronger enough. In contrast, industries like aerospace, automotive and offshore energy are dealing with newer and more complex materials which commonly known as composites. Now, if you are not familiar that what composites are, let me just give you a, a brief outline about this is. Composites are materials that build upon from two or multiple constituent materials with uh, significantly different physical or even chemical properties. But when combined, those materials create a new material with characteristics quite different or far more different from the Im from the each individual components of that material for example fiber optics maybe many of you have heard about this but i will not discuss here about here that what fiber optics is but this is just a simple example of composites but what composites are it is a lightweight and uh, you can think this as a lightweight and stronger material which makes them unique and ideal to build various things that we often see in our outsides like airplanes and wind turbines. It is because of their behavior that make them unique. But you know what? There are certain cases, for example, under stress how this material behaves. It is not well known and you can think this as a open problem in this century as well. For instance, when a new airplane design uses composite materials, the very focus engineers need to figure out is how this uh, airplane will perform under different flying conditions. For example, if the outside environment is extremely cold or even it's in high speed turbine impact is going on, then how this will behave? And you know what? The challenging aspect here is 
there is no common formula to determine that what will happen in such scenarios. Therefore, engineers have to heavily rely on experimental results and based on that, they make the decisions on those findings. Now, for those of you who are interested in getting into this field and pursue your career, your research career or thinking if you are joining industry to gain some handfuls of experience, I would suggest some software tools here that may help you to start with in this dynamic field, especially in computational mechanics and structural engineering. As I mentioned that I will mention some of the few software tools, but uh, if you are really interested, no worries at all, our guests will give a vivid descriptions of several useful tools and why and how you should use those. So uh, let's say Abacus, which is a very popular finite element analysis software, which is famously known of its robust capabilities in modeling, particularly for composite materials and advanced simulations. It helps to predict how materials behave under various stress and uh, different conditions. Console Multiphysics This software excels in simulating and analyzing multiphysics problems where multiple physical models interact. It's great for understanding how different physical phenomena affect each other in a single model. I will share one more software tool which is also widely used in this field. It is MatCode which is a specialized tool designed for material and structural analysis, often used for analyzing com composite materials and their behavior under different conditions. On top of that, it is particularly useful for students learning the subjects and uh, engineer professionals focusing on advanced material modeling and progressive damage analysis. MatCode helps in understanding the intricate behavior of material performance which makes it a valuable resources for engineer professionals dealing with the complex composites. So long story short, if today's discussion intrigues you, and you are thinking to build your career in this direction or if you have already started your career in this direction then I can positively say that this session will be very much helpful for you. You will gain lots of insight from our today's discussion. Okay, so without any further delay, let us begin our today's session. So thanks Dr. Rudra Prasad for joining us in today's discussions. We are going to have a lots of interesting talk today with you covering on different topics uh, and I hope that it's going to be really interesting for our viewers as well and definitely we are looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So starting with uh, can you share your journey from bachelor's to PhD at uh, Vanderbilt University and uh, your role you have also worked as an engineer in on different farms in india and where you are today leading up to your current positions at uh, kronos technology uh, thank you Oyan, for inviting me for having me in your podcast share my experience as a practicing engineer and uh, it is really necessary for students uh, younger engineers to know that perspective uh, how it works after uh, completing bachelor's, master's and going to the industry, how it works. So uh, I'm really thankful. Uh, to start with, uh, I started my career almost 20 years ago as, a, as an engineer, structural engineer for a consulting engineering firm in India. And my day-to-day -day job was to design steel structures. I used to design mostly for industrial structures, steel plants. It happened like uh, after two, year work, two years working there, there was an event. We got one client came, came to us and said that they had a conveyor gallery failed in one of the steel plants. So we were asked to redesign that conveyor gallery and the timeline was very short, like Within five days, we had to produce the design drawing so that people can construct the conveyor gallery and the whole structure is operational. So to do this work, I was one of the youngest member in that team. I learned so many things like how to analyze a failure when you don't, don't have any other data. For example, you have uh, design drawings of the existing structure that failed. That's it. You have no other data. So how you can go from there? So it gave me insight that, uh, okay, how to analyze the failure pattern 
and the potential cause of failure. And I was really intrigued by the way of analyzing the, the failure of a structure because I was being trained to design from scratch. There is nothing but when doing it backward, this kind of reverse way, I'm looking into how the structure failed. I was really fascinated and I tried to understand the damage mechanism the structural mechanics and the failure. We identified that the structure failed because of uh, material degradation and some lack of maintenance issues. Now, the material degradation, how that works. So, to understand that, I delved into uh, several uh, literature, published published literature from uh, publications, and uh, I found out that the emerging topic on damage mechanics. So, to learn more, I thought, okay, this is uh, fine that uh, I am an engineer, but I need to know more to be an excellent practicing engineer beyond the traditional structural design. I went to IIT Kharagpur to do my master's. I worked my, my thesis on continuum damage mechanics. And after finishing my master's, I came back to academia as a faculty member in one of the colleges in Kolkata. But the thing is, in academia, you have to have a PhD to be kind of the tenure track assistant professor. To fulfill that, I came to the United States. I look into where the better research infrastructure were there in computational mechanics. And that's how I chose Vanderbilt University because that, that is one of the top universities in the United States that has a better computing infrastructure when I'm talking about the computational mechanics aspect, damage mechanics aspect. So that's the reason I came to Vanderbilt University. I worked on projects sponsored by US Air Force Research Lab on composite materials predicting progressive damage. After finishing my uh, PhD from Vanderbilt, I joined Thornton Tomasity because I already had a uh, professional experience working for industrial projects, industrial structures, designing industrial structures. So I went to Thornton Tomasity as a senior engineer and uh, Primarily worked on building structures, occasionally worked on uh, a few projects where I worked on finite element analysis using Abacus. And after that, I uh, joined Kronos Technology, which is where I'm uh, right now. Uh, I'm do doing design of uh, subsea structures uh, using finite element analysis software called Abacus. So that's the, that's the whole career path from a bachelor's structural engineer, how I gained my knowledge and experience and that helped me to land in my present position from a traditional structural engineer to a finite element analyst. So I just have a uh, few queries here. So as you mentioned that uh, it is uh, mandatory that uh, to work as a professor in academia to have a PhD degree. So do you, do you have plan to switch in academia or you want to continue as an industry? I want to uh, continue in the industry. Uh, I had a plan to go back to academia. Uh, somehow that didn't work. So uh, that's why I'm planning to stick to my industry career path. Uh, it is often thought that when someone is doing PhD, they need to stick to academia, like do the postdoctoral research and something like that. But I disagree with that idea. Uh, postdoctoral training is kind of a training someone gets to do independent research irrespective of their principal investigator or the mentor is doing, like mentoring PhD students, how to get the work done from a PhD student, those kind of, those kind of training. That's the process. That's the purpose of postdoctoral research. But Industry is still looking for skills that, that we learn during our PhD. For example, I have learned how to deal with the numerical convergence issues in the finite element software Abacus in, in my PhD. I'm, I'm using that experience, that skill when right now in the industry, I'm trying to solve complex problems that the same, same skills. So it, it is, it is kind of a transferable skills and industry needs those skills from PhD graduates. Right now, the, the way the industrial revolution is taking place, because we are in the fourth industrial revolution and uh, everything is now available. Knowledge is not confined into specific college or universities. It's, it's available everywhere. 
uh, I am I am mentoring so many students, undergraduate civil engineering students, structural engineering master students, PhD students who are looking for like how to develop skills so that they can contribute to the industry. So I am happy with my position that uh, I am. Uh, utilizing my skills that I gained during my PhD and basically throughout my past 20 years of career. So it is kind of a balancing. I mean, you are working as an industry and you're also doing your, I mean, mentoring or guiding type of thing as what a PhD supervisor do. That's right. That's right. I, I just have one comment here that it is being said that once you have a PhD, getting a job, the, the field of getting job it's it's quite narrow actually people uh, sometimes get i mean sometimes get rejected because they are overqualified so what do you think about this so it is true because phd is a process where where someone learns very specific things and go into the depth rather than growing in the breadth so PhD students after completing PhD faces some kind of challenge to getting industry because of the reason that they are doing something in a depth, but they forget about expanding their bread. But in industry, people are looking for problem solvers, like clients will come to a consulting firm and like ask to solve a problem immediately in a very short time span. And that's where the skill of bread because th those problems are typically solved using very traditional structural engineering softwares where you don't need to deal with those convergence issues like typical uh, finite element softwares, Abacus, ANSYS, where you need to be very cautious about selecting the parameters. Now, someone with PhD, they, they need to understand that where they are going and what they are planning to do. So if they are planning to do complicated challenging problems that involve research, there are some places. Yes, in industry, there are some places who has opening in doing this kind of stuff. But mostly in the industry, people follow the traditional path of solving structural engineering. For example, tra using traditional structural engineering software, following the codes and standards. In different countries, they use different codes and standards. So, that's the skill industry is immediately looking looking from a graduate. But the thing is, when someone has PhD, they had additional analytical skill that they can utilize to solve complicated problems if that shows up in their company. So it is re recommended for a PhD student who who is studying their subject in depth to remain in touch with the earlier knowledge that they have gained in their graduation so that uh, after completing their PhD if they are not getting any positions then they can also switch to some industry well the, the thing is the, the, the word industry is very broad when when I'm talking about someone with PhD looking for a job and when someone uh, with bachelor's in civil engineering or mechanical engineering looking for a job that's that's a completely different perspective entry level bachelor's level jobs you just solve the problem that you have learned solving in your school or in your college university when someone with phd in addition to those skills like the traditional way they have learned skills to solve problems when the problems are a little bit off from the traditional problem formulation so uh, i do not think industry means the traditional when i talk about industry it's traditional civil engineering industry uh, civil mechanical mechanics engineering industry and uh, non traditional advanced research based in industry for example the the automotive industry uh, aerospace industry they they are also producing uh, products for customers need but they are doing advanced research they are working on advanced composite materials, developing composite materials. They are trying to understand that how composite material fails so that they can build better aeroplane or better cars. So that's the thing uh, I want to sh share is that when someone is in the PhD program, they should focus on doing their work, but beyond their academic curriculum, they need to participate in 
conferences specifically industry conferences and need to know that what industry is doing and how they can contribute their experience their skills their knowledge in the in the specific industry applications that that's how the the, the process should work i am not talking someone uh, with phd to go back to some uh, company and work uh, as like a bachelor's uh, someone with bachelor's will do i'm not telling that i'm telling someone with phd needs to learn the skills during phd but also need to understand how the industry is working several sectors have their several needs for example aerospace automotive have their different needs of uh, customer based products now the phd needs to understand that the the skill the lesson they have learned during their college or university how they can apply those in the industrial application let us now discuss about your research work oh i think you do not want to say yourself i mean think yourself as a researcher you are more biased to think yourself as a finite element analysis engineer okay so continuing with that uh, but i am asking this because i have seen lots of your research paper working and uh, based on that i have some queries so i will say you as a i mean your research work that uh, for listeners uh, unfamiliar with the term uh, if you share something that what is uh, traditional structural engineering is and uh, with this i have one more query that what do you think that uh, some typical challenges engineer or researchers face or i would say experience regarding material behavior and uh, mechanics uh, modeling if you could share some insights about this sure so uh, when i call that terminology traditional structural engineer i typically mean that someone is going to design buildings and ensure that the building can withstand uh, wind load seismic loading uh, flood in case of cold regions those are like uh, winter snow snowstorm those kind of thing so traditional structural engineering has been developed for last i would say more than close to 100 years or more the structural mechanics structural engineering and uh, people no longer solve problems by their hands and they they use uh, structural engineering softwares such as uh, stad risa sap there are there are so many these are there are some examples so how did this this software came up this this software came up based on the methodology developed by civil engineers called matrix analysis method like all the equations that cannot be solved for multi degree of freedom problem that cannot be solved by hand so computer is a kind of useful tool to solve those type of system of linear equation problem and the tool that we use from mathematics is the the matrix algebra so civil engineers got the idea to combine mathematics with the civil engineering or structural engineering governing equation to solve them so the recent challenges there are recent challenges in this field because now everyone is trying to go towards a sustainable development and to achieve the sustainable development the structural engineers are trying to design structures with with net zero carbon now that's one aspect that aspect ne- has never been researched or thought about before i'm talking about 20 years ago but the code and standards everything was been developed over last 50 years i would say and those considerations were not there in those core and standards now how the the new civil engineers who are now coming from industry from school college to industry how they will tackle this issue like they have been taught uh, how to do beam design how to do column design but they have not been taught how to sustainably design beam or column so that that's one challenge there's a second thing is the climate change because of this climate change whether the approach we are taking in developing codes and standards are the are are those methodologies uh, valid 
that's that's another question in case of like a severe storm that that has never happened uh, in 100 years those are called more than like 100 years return period how to design a structure that that has never been affected for over 100 years but it might be affected by some storm that that will happen some in the range of 150 years of return period so those kind of challenges and uh, people are focusing more on the performance based design that's another approach that is coming in the in the in the traditional uh, building structure design industry now on the non traditional what i'm calling non traditional is like uh, automotive aerospace automotive engineers aerospace engineers they also solve structural mechanics problem beam vibration uh, shell vibration those are all structural fundamentally structural mechanics problem but to to do that uh, they use different types of software they use strong finite general purpose finite element softwares like uh, abacus ansys ls dyna there are other softwares from msc softwares which are now called uh, hexagon so those softwares are more lean towards the finite element based analysis now to understand how the finite element based analysis and uh, traditional matrix analysis method differs it is not quite different but still it's different because this finite element analysis this tool is kind of uh, mathematically intensive they need to go much deeper in the in the from the perspective of depth of knowledge so aerospace industry is trying to solve the beam problem but the thing is they are trying to use a different material same with automotive industry composite materials composite materials why they are using because those are lightweight materials and high strength the challenge is this material the comp- like carbon fiber composite those are high strength materials but engineers and researchers are still trying to understand how that structure is failing or how that material failure happens compared to steel like the traditional structural material steel concrete because people have worked for 100 years on on these materials engineers pretty much understand how a steel structure failure will happen but this is this is an open domain when people are uh, thinking about composite materials so that's that's how this is this is different on another aspect for example uh, i am working in the offshore pipeline industry i am using traditional steel but the the problem i am trying to solve is very complex and it it varies depending on on the location the fundamental mechanics problem is same but depending of the on the site location my problem is changing and i have to adapt that uh, and modify my finite element model accordingly to capture that so that's how the the vast field of civil mechanical a little bit of metallurgy i'd say mechanical metallurgy where people uh, study about cleave fatigue fracture mechanics so these these are the area where everything is common so i call it applied mechanics so everyone can contribute uh, there is no barrier like you are a civil engineer you are a structural engineer applied mechanics is an interdisciplinary domain where anyone with their, their expertise can contribute so uh, to answer your question yeah that, that's that's the way we should we should think about when we are thinking about separate traditional and non traditional or advanced uh, industries so as you mentioned that uh, about the damage or fracture because of uh, because of various reasons Uh, like extreme conditions or high speed impacts or temperature or whatever be the natural phenomena so is there any way to predict that um, to to predict the damage growth in in let's say in composite structures well the the thing is the, the, there are ways but the the field is not yet matured enough people are still learning things from experiments the first approach is to to repeat something from experiment observe some phenomena and then try to model that to predict like in future okay this structure will fail in this way 
Now, people are still trying to understand how composite materials are failing under compression. It's, it's, it's kind of an emerging topic. Uh, tensile property of composites is a bit known nowadays, but under compression, when fiber buckling, fiber kinking, those kind of things, and the effect of manufacturing, how that is affecting the structural response. So those kind of things, many industry, is, they, are, they are working on, on these topics. So everyone is trying to develop some tool, prediction tool that can predict the failure of composite structures, but none of the tools nowadays available are foolproof. They are in the process of developing. There are some techniques, there are some uh, research codes that NASA, US Air Force Lab, even, even I have worked on uh, some of the research codes where I used continuum damage mechanics to capture the micro scale damage and how that can propagate at macro scale. This is called multi-scale modeling. So looking into the experimental results, we are calibrating our uh, multi-scale model parameters and trying to predict the same failure behavior of composite laminates. So this is this is kind of not yet matured. People are trying to get somewhere so that they can validate or can unify a process and can say, okay, this is the failure criteria like a traditional steel fails. Uh, th there is no unanimous decision. Okay, this is the failure criteria for composite. People are trying to use like von Mises or several other criteria in, in industry to model composite, but that, that doesn't, doesn't work very well because that, that works for steel and any other metallic material, but that doesn't work well for composite materials. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing process, ongoing uh, research process. People are trying to understand and uh, trying to develop predictive tools that can say how the structure will fail. So yeah, that's that, that's kind of yeah. So my next question is r regarding a balancing between both industry and academia, as you have had experience to both. So particularly for students, what do you think? I mean, the industry ready skills that are required for a structural engineering or civil engineering or mechanical engineering background students. But this is this is a very very important question and uh, i'm really happy that you you raised this question uh, these are not often uh, talked about and that's why uh, students face challenges when they they look for industry jobs so what i would say is that first and foremost is that thorough understanding of uh, structural mechanics solid mechanics some some people call it strength of materials this, this is this is really needed and need to understand the, the the failure mechanisms the next is to learn a couple of softwares i would say at least so for for example i'm giving some example for traditional sector i would say stad risa sap 2000 midas etabs microstation at least one of those softwares from the cad perspective i would say uh, autocad it is better if you have revit and nevis work at least one of them and MathCAD. I know students uh, use, usually use uh, math, math lab in the college and university, but in the industry, because all the calculations are archived somewhere or submitted to the client. So that's, that's why MathCAD is, is a very, very uh, useful tool. So someone, someone needs to learn at least one of from these things, like the, from the analysis software, from the, uh, CAD software and the, the design and calculation performing those. I'm assuming that e everyone will have the knowledge about using Microsoft Excel. So with Microsoft Excel, uh, Math, MathCAD, that would be good enough. At least one of these finite element softwares, for example, Abacus, ANSYS, and uh, finally, they should have the skill of uh, writing program in uh, scripting languages such as uh, MATLAB and Python. Nowadays, uh, Python is more favored because, because this is open source. You do not need to purchase a license. So uh, Python is more preferred and uh, Python is more robust compared to uh, MATLAB when uh, I'm giving some example. 
I use Abacus and I do all the automation process in Python, like geometry creation, I write Python program, extracting uh, results from output database. I write, I have Python script and I just extract data using my Python script. These are significant time saver. Now, why I'm talking about significant time saving? Because that, that's an important aspect in, in the industry. You need to understand how the whole process works. Now, you are working as a designer or as an analyst. You are designing, you are analyzing it. And then after this structure analysis, it is going to uh, someone who will work on it further. For example, building design. You are analyzing a building and you are getting the reaction that that will be transferred to the foundation. Then someone will design the foundation and the building will be built. How the building will be built? It will be built just in the reverse order. So you, you need to be aware of the schedule, how the process works. You, you are designing the foundation last, but that is the first on the schedule for the construction people. Uh, th they will start building from the foundation and go up from substructure to superstructure. So you need to have very good understanding of the, how uh, the whole process works. In addition to that, I would, I would like to mention that you should have some idea about the, the, the contract process, like what type of contract you are working on. If it is uh, time and material, fixed price, you should have some idea so that so that you can adjust your work pace according to that these are the very basic skills you need to understand when when you are in the school i know that all universities and colleges they they, they teach the course called uh, construction project management but it is not really construction project management but you have to understand that the, the bigger picture of the construction management or the project management so yeah this this is the answer to your question like how students should uh, prepare themselves uh, or make themselves industry ready when they are leaving the school or college university so as we are on the verge of the ending of our session today but uh, before ending this session i have one final questions which i usually ask to all of my guests that uh, what are some important pieces of advice you would like to share with our guests, mainly students, especially from fresh BTEC students to those who are thinking about pursuing PhD or thinking about joining industry? So if you have any important pieces of advice for them, so what would you like to share with them? Okay, this is, this is also a very important question. Uh, and I, this is not my advice. I, I would like to say, I think this in a different way. So I look at the life in a different way. The, the perspective of life, the way I look at is that the most important things in life, I have to identify that F for me, this is health, both physical and mental health and money, because you have to pay the bill, you have to pay the rent, you have to pay the, the electricity and those kind of things. So sometimes uh, people say that do not run after money that's not always true even if you are researcher or engineer you need some research funding you need your client to fund your company so money is a very very important thing so keep that in mind both health and money the next thing i always look when i look into the mirror i am competing with myself from the past I'm not competing with any anybody around me. I'm trying to make myself better. Gratitude about, about your life, like what you have got, and that will give you a huge mental peace because nowadays uh, I heard so many news about suicides in India and many places. People have suicide awareness, but the thing is, uh, somehow we are, we are losing the, the, the idea of gratitude. We provide significant mental peace. So have gratitude for what you have. Next is accept failure. I have failed many times in, in my career, professional career. Failure made me stronger. So to be successful, you, you have to follow some established approach in a very disciplined way. Failure doesn't mean that your life is ending. You are learning from the failure and correct that. 
The next, I would say, is the self-learning is a key. Learn from open, open source. There are, there are so many open source mat study materials, academic material, non-academic material. Next, another I would emphasize is that having a mentor for, for your career. This is, this is valid for someone as early career students, early career engineers, mid career engineers. Even nowadays, I, I have some mentors who are mentoring me to improve me. I'm a mid career professional, but I am being mentored by someone who, has, who is more experienced than me and never feel ashamed. Like you always keep the student mindset. Even if you go outside your college or university or school to give you that the last, this is not an advice, but some I, that idea is that to earn money, the traditional approach is to look for an employment. It not only matters what you know, it's who you know. It's a decent way I'm, I'm saying this. This will give you a much better approach to network with your peers or senior level uh, practicing engineers in the industry. Do network with them. So it not only matters what you know, it's who you know. So you have to know people because now knowledge is not confined within university boundaries. So you have to learn who can help you get your career progress and successfully. So that's kind of my advice to students, young professionals, young engineers, everyone. Thank you once again, Dr. Rudra Prashad, for joining us today and uh, sharing your insightful perspectives. I personally enjoyed this conversation immensely and uh, I, I have learned also lots of things from you. And I hope you also enjoyed these uh, discussions with me today. So I believe, uh, on top of that, I believe that our viewers, mainly students, will find it engaging and in insightful as well. So yeah, looking forward to more discussions on different topics in the near future. Yeah, see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.